Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Killer Collab Podcast. My name is Tony Deck and Tony D. To my first left, we have Chris Leto from Reaper Films. Howdy. To my other left, Joe Davison. Hi. And from The Conjuring, the devil made me do it, our special guest, Paul Wilson. The first one I felt the first one I fell, I fell in love with. And people were, like, arguing with me all the time. They're like, why? I was like, dude, the whole movie centers around that one scene where they're all trying to grab her right. under the house. That movie was so crazy. The whole thing goes to that point. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. I, I love, I just loved the first one so much. It had such a Kubrick vibe to it, you know? Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and I think that's where James Wan and the team, Peter Sapp and the producer, they've really excelled at creating such a unique style. I mean, of course, the funny part is, I think that my brother is in you know, the Insidious franchise and the Conjuring franchise, and that's uh, Ronald and James Wan. I mean, Lee and James created Saw and right. came together for Saw and kind of created that franchise. Yep. And then uh, Lee wanted to do the Insidious kind of horror franchise, and James really didn't. So James said, well, I'll just take my little Conjuring project. And so they're both are obviously very successful, but Patrick is kind of the too. two. That's and Patrick, Patrick will direct the fifth Insidious starting next month. Fantastic. Yeah, starring us as <laughs> as a detective team who comes in and we fight ghosts. That would be fun. I could put him in the board. Oh, all right, great. Right. <laughs> He's going to be the, every help I he's gonna be the <laughs> next seven degrees of separation. He's going to be the next one, Patrick. Will be the oh yeah yeah instead of sure. Kevin Bacon he'll be the new Kevin Bacon yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could be yeah um, we had a good time shooting that Conjuring show there was some there was some spooky stuff that happened there on set that I would tell you but uh, when you know you're in a Conjuring movie when the party gift is holy water <laughs> <laughs> did it burn when it when it when it, when it touched you uh, it, was, it always burns me I don't know about you. No, I was fine, luckily, so I guess I passed the mustard. Um, we had moments where there were, um, when we shot, the, I play called Grazzo, and in the Grazzo house, which was in Samoa, where they shoot a lot of Walking Dead, the exterior, um, basically, uh, there's a house that was used in Bright Green to It's a very kind of classic Victorian-looking mansion. Um, where it was like July, about 95 degrees, and they call it hot weather for a reason, right? Yeah. And so we had gone into the foyer to kind of, all we were shooting that day was the arrival of the house, which is in kind of the very opening scenes of the movie. And so we went inside for a break with a reverse camera, and this production assistant comes running out of this little parlor. I was like, what's wrong with you? And she's like, don't come in there. That light is on and it's not plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> Weird stuff. The very first take of our scene, I mean, my first day on the job and first take, it was a scene where the Glasser family moves into the house where you know the spirit uh, will occupy later and harass us. I don't want to give it all away. The first take, about you know, about a hundred people in crew and cameras on an eighty foot gym. <clears throat> And he yells, action, we're ready. And then, boom, a compressor blows up. So just kind of odd. Hmm, on the first take of the house in which we're going to be terrorized by this something. Right. The very first take, we get a little warning shot. So yeah. little things like that. I would have resigned. <laughs> yeah. You guys have fun with this so like, movie. I'm going to have a good time. <laughs> Floating on a flamingo in Florida. Oh, man. I couldn't imagine that happening on any set. Just, just especially a conjuring set. No, yeah. no. I would be freaked out to the to the degree of like, yeah, no, yeah, no. I'm gonna go. Um, every every <laughs> time, every every obviously I'm only in the third one, but every time they would start the first day, and we actually had it at the table room, we had some Catholic priests come and bless the crew and cast. Because there's some crazy stuff yeah. we're dealing with. But um, uh, let's just put it this way. I, I, I it's it challenge you not to think this is all real. Let's put it that way. Um, do you think that helped you get into? The I already mindset? feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you think that helped you get into the mindset of uh, of you know the, that type of movie? Like did it, like did it prepare you, or they were just doing it because it was actually legitimate? Like no, they I mean, they really believe that uh, you know this, we're dealing with heavy subject matter when you're talking about conjuring up the devil and demons. Mm -hmm. um, 
the, the clergy don't like that. So they wanted to make sure we were, um, you know, in good shape, let's say spiritually and protected. Um, okay. And it, it definitely, you know, it'll wake you up when that happens. We also had a guest arrive uh, on set who was actually sent to prison for murder. He stabbed somebody 19 times. And that's one of the characters portrayed in the movie, in Conjuring 3. And that was a little odd, meeting someone who was effectively a murderer, convicted murderer. Yes. And he, um, he was out of prison? Oh, yeah. He said his name is Arnie Johnson, right? And so he, he was convicted um, of, involved, of, of manslaughter. That was, the charge was reduced. It's the very first case in American history where an accused murderer um, claimed uh, his defense was by reason of demonic possession. And the jury believed him. Uh, it was a very famous book called The Devil in Connecticut. That's a, a big part of the plot of Conjuring 3. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. I want to so, yeah, they were sure charge, and he served five years, and then he got married, and then she just passed away, but he, he got married to Not Debbie Glotzel, who's the daughter of the character that I played. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Did she die of knife wounds? <laughs> um, <laughs> too soon. <laughs> sadly, she, sadly, she just didn't wake up one day. So, um, because of knife wounds? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't there, so I can't officially say. <laughs> right, right. Or else you'll get stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> I go out all day, folks. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm put here on this seat. To... You see what I have to deal with every week? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I should become a saint for having to deal with this guy. Oh, come on. Come on. <laughs> I don't know. He, What's he, it like working under James Wan's direction? Is he... Like how's your oh, just it will make you feel like a child. I mean, he's really fun. Everything's exciting. He's like in the corner. A, a, a certain, a certain thing, enthusiasm that is infectious to say the least. But I, I think the entire team have got this so well dialed in that they know exactly what they want. Um, in in our case, what was really kind of fun is the movie was ready to go on September 11th of 2020. Right. Um, and then, you know, we had this craziness occur yeah. um, called COVID. Well, it gave us a chance to kind of get the audience to test it. So we actually got some really wonderful feedback through the studio tests, the screenings, and uh, we're able to, I think, end up with a better movie because one of the, the primary baddies played by Lucian of And Who in the movie, in well. the script, and what we shot, right, um, the audience wanted more of that and kind of had to solve really a little bit of a, an issue that we couldn't really see until the very end. Right. So we ended up with more of her character, which I think makes it a lot more, a lot more scary and a lot more yeah, fun. Oh, yeah, we definitely know her very well. She's been on the show uh, before, so she, she was on here for a, a really good show. Um, she, yeah, she said a lot. A couple of things happened on, on set as well, so I, I was just curious of how, how, uh-huh. how much, how, how, if you could experience those stuff too, but I guess so. <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's, there was definitely some weirdness. I mean, she and I didn't work the same days. Um, well, that's why I was, there was, I was curious, because she, she mentioned some some supernatural stuff, and I was like, okay. And then you came out, and I was like, okay. Okay, <laughs> so that was just a little. <laughs> so that, that's, that's very funny. James yeah. Watt definitely mastered the art of the jump scare. Like, mm. you never really saw jump scares like his until Conjuring. Um you know, that whole, like, real tense moment. And then you think something's going to jump out and it doesn't, and you relax, and then it pops out, and you're just like, ah! <laughs> like, he's totally mastered that. And uh, Especially in Conjuring 3. Um, and the stuff that they reshot, or I should say the additional footage that they shot, based on the, the audience feedback, the, that sequence with her coming down the hall is still scary to watch. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so how many changes and how many additions were uh, put in after all the, after some of the screenings? Well, one character was completely eliminated. Oh, so, wow. yeah, um, and then and then the actor was brought back, which was a class move from T, of course, Absolutely. to find another role for him. So, but he was faced to being cut completely out of the movie. Yeah. Oh man, um, that's tough. And and they. Uh, the audience more or less kind of tied two of these characters together in the, t- in the test screenings. They were not tied together in the script. So that, that made for a really interesting kind of 
there at the end of that relationship. Yeah. Um, so a lot of the sequences between the priest, the retired um, clergy, uh, played by the great John Edward, um, and usually were, were shot really uh, just before we were released. So, you know, I think it came out when, Joe? Was it June? Yeah, June. Yeah, June. June. June of last year. So I think usually we're still shooting in like February or March of last year at this time to finish that sequence. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's like under the gun, man. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, uh, making those decisions to cut out a whole character—that that's a tough decision to make, and also tough for the actor to even understand. But uh, it was a real class move to bring him back. Um, <laughs> totally. Yeah, they didn't have to do that. Yeah, and it, was, it really was just based on the audience. Just were like, we don't really know where, how he fits in. Yeah. So, but that that tells you the conviction with which these filmmakers know what they got in terms of this franchise. Yeah. Um, for our audience that doesn't um, quite understand like the industry, can you explain a little bit of the test screening process and wh what it actually is set to accomplish um, and how the test screening you know, um, operation is, is taken? Very often, especially when you're dealing with a, a franchise that has a lot of future potential and certainly has a lot of equity built into it based on its previous success, in the, in the former iterations, the, the big studios will do this and spend a lot of time bringing in test audiences. They do it usually in Burbank, Los Angeles, and they give them a little questionnaire. And how do you relate to this character? Who was your favorite character? Did you understand this? Um, what did you feel about this? You know, basically, it, it gives you, as a producer, uh, and certainly you know the production team, it gives you an opportunity to kind of get a real live audience reacting, and then you can record them. And a lot of times, that's the fun stuff to watch, <laughs> is to watch the body language when you know a certain, yeah, this is a scary moment, let's see if it scares them. Or this is a moment of wonder, let's see if they laugh here. Um, so that really gives you a real-time sense of what an audience, how an audience will react to it. And in the case, obviously, of this, it gave us the chance to kind of have an audience um, support in terms of really helping augment a better story. Hmm. And do they give, do they give the audience like questionnaires or something? Yeah. 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 Now, so so how many test audiences do they generally do? Do they do like like one or two sittings or like one? I think they I think it's four. I think they did four over the course of a month. Hmm. Um, yeah, and it's it's it, you know usually it's especially when you're living in Los Angeles and you're kind of selected to do that. A lot of these companies like data companies. In one of my careers, I analyzed media coverage for capital motor trials. And those services, those third-party audit services like Nielsen ratings, you put it to, uh, uh, Nielsen television ratings and then Comscore, um, they're also in the movie business. So they will pull together um, an audience um, based on the demo, the demographic you think your, your movie, or in this case, you know, this franchise really is aimed at. Yeah. Uh, and then they'll also bring in other audiences, you know, and that might be, you know, 65 plus for a horror movie if they want to see it and get their feedback because they may be a key influencer and a 30 year old that might want to go see that movie or get that movie. Yeah, that's interesting. I was in a test screening for a movie called Happy Texas years ago, 20 years ago, and hmm. William H. Macy in it, mm -hmm. and he played a local town sheriff. Uh, Stephen Zahn was in it, I think. He I played Happy uh, Texas. Like He's him. great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, Steve Zahn. Yeah. Great. Have you seen Happy Texas? Yeah, I've seen it. I have. Yeah. Long. Well, Anyways, I thought it was interesting. And there's a whole list of stuff we had to fill out. Uh, like that. Just very similar. Mm -hmm. Like, what was your favorite part? Who's your favorite character? Did you see yourself in any of the characters? Blah blah blah. Right. Would you buy this movie? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, we lost. What happened? Did well, you leave? Oh, there, there you are. are. <laughs> Sorry, someone's someone's calling me out of jettison them. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really valuable feedback if you can do it. I mean, you know, I think every producer should try to do that. And I think the temptation is once you finish a movie, and whatever the scope your movie is, you know, a little a, a small independent movie, or you know, you're part of a bigger um, in a project, you really should try to. I think get some real time audience feedback because I like to say, well, I don't care what you're doing; it's who buys it we've got to focus on. Yeah. And, and so many times, filmmakers, you know, rush to get it going and start shooting and got a great script, got a great team going, and at the end, they have no 
real sense of how to, how we're going to market this movie. How you know we're just going to go sell it, dump it to a store. They're not, they're not going to just hand you a check. Yeah. You know, they, you know, for your work. Yeah. And you really got to understand that. So um, I, I always loved the idea. And, and again, being working in the advertising and media business, and um, especially with analyzing media coverage for motor trials, I mean, that's life or death stuff right there. Um, I like the data-driven approach. But I think if, if more, especially more filmmakers did that, they'd have a better sense of how to, you know, pay back their investors. Yes. You know, which at the end of the day, you've got to be a fiduciary to those that have to really facilitate your vision. Yeah, absolutely. I think analytics is a very big portion of making film because you know what tests well. You know what, how people react to certain things, and you know you know if that's going to sell. If people are looking for this and they get this, you know you got to make that jive and make go to, make it go together. So if you if you yeah. if you go make movies strictly by analytics, like X amount of uh, jump scares or X amount of the score on, on the on the film, like you you know you know, X Y Z equals successful film. So you have an idea of what what to expect in the box office, and you well, know that's what I've been doing wrong all these years. Oh, we've been telling you for no years. Yeah, been doing algebra. <laughs> <laughs> and one plus one does not equal four. Okay. No. <laughs> but I, I, I think. But I think, but I think that's what's wrong with Hollywood right now. It's all formula based. Sure. It's like Adam Sandler plus Drew Barrymore equals this much money. Yes. And. But it, it but, not my thing. But, but, but you said the key. Well, key like I think that. it takes I the creative Barrymore. process out of it. I mean, have you know? No, but, it, but oh, I love Drew Barrymore as much as the next guy. But, but you said it I'm yourself. You said it yourself. Like it equals money. If they know that they're going to make X by money, it's a business. Huh. Film filmmaking is a business. Yeah, it's and, the business of art, which is a very interesting, yes, uh, the abstract concept of how do you turn a image, moving or stationary, into money. Yes, and that's basically. <clears throat> Uh, what filmmaking is. That's what the industry is. Yeah, and you got to find that balance between um, be, yeah. giving your art and also making money on it. So finding that balance, because you, you, you hear all, all the time where the producer or, or directors and writers, they lose their vision because it gets touched by so many different things. Well, right. if you do this, it'll make a little bit more. You, you, you'll be able to get more ROI on that particular scene. So you'll be able to um, recoup some of that. You might lose some of your art, but you know, but that's that's the, the thing you lose in white, big studios. Paul, do you think analytics has lost the creative process along the way? I mean, as far as filmmakers being more creative than they used to be, do you feel like that it's lost that because of analytics? I think you have, you know, again, we're in a history, a moment in history, in, in let's say consumer viewing habits, you know. They used to call it television. Now it's uh, streaming, and it's right. you know, OTT, over the top product. Yep. But and, and and people consume television differently than they used to, right? Yes. And I think we're seeing such a divide now between the studio projects um, and then the independent films. But certainly, thanks to the way COVID has changed this, the theatrical business, um, you're going to see more and more of it. You're going to see more of kind of a study in synectics, you know, make the strange familiar and the familiar strange. Yeah. Um, and so much of it is Sorry, derivative. Um, that, uh, sadly, I, don't, I, I still think it's going to be a while before we're going to see kind of independent movies have the theatrical support that they once did. Yes. Um, mainly because we have so many different options now to consume that kind of stuff. Right. Now I'm working on a Christmas movie. Um, that frankly, I think I'm going to stop working on right now because those are consumed at home now, thanks to COVID yeah. and consumer habits. So you're, you're going to see less and less kind of theatrical versions of that. Um, mm. Certainly, the data-driven you know, studios in about 15 or 20 years ago started uh, populating their C-level suites with marketing people. They had no concept for how to tell a story, no concept for how to cast you know, a movie. But they're all data driven. So I think we've seen, like you just mentioned, kind of those, you know, throw two stars together, come up with a crazy formula that works, and shoot it and get it done, right? Um, I remember when Adam Sanders did happen at Netflix, it was like that $35 million for five year, you know, five project years or something. Right. I mean, he could just crank about that sophomore stuff all day long. Now, I'm not yeah. saying. Um, certainly, he's got a much better, I think, much better sense of dramatic acting than he used to have. Yes. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not denigrating his skill, but that is a studio play of just let's just cough it up and get this thing 
you know, get this product out there because we know it can sell. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, to a degree, but I think it's it's still, you know, if you listen to you know the Spielbergs of the world, and, and even to a degree, some of these. You know, I remember working with Mike Nichols, and it was about storytelling. And Mike, Mike Nichols used to say, and a set of angels in America, and it's actually a great documentary called Becoming Mike Nichols. There are only three types of scenes. Only three. Anything else should be cut. You know, conflict, seduction, and negotiation. Because that's what we do in life. Yeah. And it was like, such a, he just stated it so perfectly. Um, but I think... That's where the filmmakers of tomorrow and today need to start striving for. Is because there's, as you guys know, we can do stuff now. We can make something that used to cost triple yep. or you know right. ten times what it does now. Um, so I, I, I still believe there's some shakeups coming in the theatrical world, um, but ultimately, you know, I just I, I hate to see these studio-driven marketing C-suite people making business decisions about stories that they're not really qualified to make, but they're doing it because of shareholders. Right. And they're doing it because of the corporate, the corporate environment in which they have to operate. And sadly, that's going to push out independent filmmakers, and there'll be a battle over what really shows up in theaters. Right. So yeah. it's definitely harmed the business data. Um, but you know, like any tool, you've got to know how to use it. Yep. So, that's what my wife says. <laughs> hey! No! Oh. It's not even noon yet. <laughs> According to this sundial, it is. It, it's almost morphing into a an area where if it's not a superhero movie or a horror movie, it's kind of getting lost. <laughs> um, I think you're right. Not to throw your brother under the bus, but Moonfall is a classic example of a huge sci-fi movie. And it just bombed. And it did. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, like really? Is that right. a Netflix I think it made $16 movie? opening weekend. Yeah, yeah, it was that. Netflix, wasn't it? No, it was released at the theater. Oh, I thought it was a Netflix movie. No. That's why I look for it on Netflix. No, I no and that's a, that's Roland right. Emmerich, and you know who's known for foreign money. Right. A lot of it from China. Yeah. I mean, even even Midway was largely produced, you know, outside of the studio, the so-called studio model. But he'll go find money from Canada, uh, where he lives, um, or China. Um, and you know he's the king of disaster movies, and it was a disaster. Yeah. I mean, but that was one that. Now they shot that during COVID, so that they had some real difficult times. They shot that in a studio in Montreal. Um, oh, that's the one with the the guy kind of looks like me in it. That's got Patrick Wilson in it, right? But and Halle other, Berry and oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If your if your yeah. beard was black, you would totally look just yeah. like him. Thank you. <laughs> he's a British guy. Kind of annoying. All right, mate. I can do British yeah, stuff. There you go. <laughs> Is that British? I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, Australian. It seems like it seems like comedies are like gone. Like I haven't even seen a good comedy. What's no. the last good other than Jackass, which I wouldn't consider a movie? Oh, no. Right. What comedy has come out in the last year or two that you're like, wow, that was a really funny movie? And like they're not even around. I haven't seen a comedy no. released in a while. No. There's no place for them right now in theaters. I think. Um, because if you look at, again, World's out to, money. You know, <laughs> the, the data, um, yeah. the only demographic that really stayed going to the theater was 18 to 34 year olds. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, right. Which is, you know, and the, the primary audience for horror. Right. Yeah. Um, what, what? And for, You're not even in that I'm demographic. <laughs> but I'm in the horror demographic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's why that's why you, you didn't see a bunch of rom coms at all, um, and again they're better played I think or better consumed at home. At home. Yeah. So yeah. I mean look at what look at what uh, Tubi's doing. Yeah, uh, some of these are really they, they're aggressive with their money to acquire content. Yeah, yeah. 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 I didn't even put my movies on there. <laughs> you know, that's aggressive. Because <laughs> <laughs> nobody's seen those. I reach for the bottom of the barrel there. <laughs> oh, yeah, I got three movies on Tubi right now. Nice. Crazy. Nice. Um, yeah. Now, with all the streaming services out there, like, what do you think is going to change with the theaters? Like, like, how are they going to survive if all drive the Marvel drive-ins? <laughs> well, if all they're producing is Marvel movies that are coming out maybe twice, three times a year, and then how many horror movies? Three to five? Like, decent ones that they can actually put in I theaters? know one that's coming out this year is going to be amazing. Yeah. In October. Called Sword. So, so do I. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I still think I, I still think there's a play for you know 
let's call it a tech company, uh, although they're referred to as studios. And Amazon's a data company, right? At yeah. the end of the day. Yes. yes. They, but very much like Apple, <clears throat> I think either one of them could buy a theater chain. I still think it's probably likely that we're going to see Disney yeah. probably tear into it. Because think about it. Disney could close all their Disney stores and all the malls, take all their Disney property, put it in the theater concessions area, yeah. and it would be like leaving a ride when you leave the movie theater if they owned it. And then they could do things like a Star Wars event. Yeah. Right? They could do things with their own IP yeah. to yeah. drive theatrical and to, you know, basically to retail operation anyway. Yeah. So think I think sort of by stuff. the end of the year, we're going to see something like that. Do you think be, it's going to be like Disney, Disney movie theater and Paramount movie theater? And like, you think it's going to come to that? It makes sense. I mean, it's going, it's going, they have the apps. I mean, you got Paramount. I think it's got app, to in some sort of form. The, the uh, Justice Department actually reversed decision, I think it was two years ago, that prevented studios from owning a theater chain. That, that is up now. So they can actually right. do that. Mm-hmm. I, I think if it hadn't been for COVID, we might have seen a move like that in some of these regional theater chains. But I mean, do you um, think that makes sense for like yeah. Paramount to have their own Absolutely. movie theater? I mean, I, obviously Disney makes sense. Like anything Disney makes Netflix sense. Netflix can do it too. Netflix can do it too with all their, their, their movies can come out in their own. But it's theaters. like, why am I going to go see a Net, Netflix movie at a Netflix theater and I just watch it at the house? Because you, you won't know be able to do that. Well, obviously, I'm a, I love going to the movies. Well, it's a different but, setting, different like film. Some of them have the IMAX. The IMAX is a different different experience sure. from a regular movie, especially yeah. If I could have saw the Adam Project in the theater, I would have. Wor- I would have. Yeah. I would have. Yeah. Like there's some movies that you just have to watch. Yeah. And, and, or maybe they'll just release them at the theater for two or three weeks and then don't sure. watch the rap, You know. Sure. I mean, if, if I'm if I'm I, I think it's Disney's probably the most likely because of their retail operation anyway. Right. But if I if I'm Disney and I have you know, let's say I have got a, a, a thousand theaters across the country mm-hmm. in key markets. You know, I'll release my own product in the theater for a little bit sure. before it goes to Disney Plus. Right. But create different events as well. Right. Sure. Right. And then, then you could. You know, that's one thing Disney doesn't do. They don't acquire content, right? Yeah. But they've got they've got to populate Matt Geo, Fox. Like they've got a lot of properties now, a lot of streaming properties. Um. They could also, you know, with the with a theatrical relationship, you know, provide filmmakers uh, like Joe and me and you guys a chance to you know, have their movie in the theater, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Because the, the alternative is you'll see nothing but studio movies because they're gonna, they're going to elbow all the little ones out of the way. Yeah. And I think that's going to change the theatrical experience. You just can't. This is just can't own it and put their own stuff in it all the time. It's got to be a different model. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's so I think we're going to see something like that. That's why I think the drive-ins are going to be resurgence. Like, they're they're really coming back strong. There was only something like 150 drive-ins like two years ago, and now there's something like 800 drive-ins. But I think they came back because COVID. Yeah. Like, well, I think they're, they're, they're back, but I think they're going to stay, man. Think so? I don't think they're going to go away. I think the people enjoy them again. I think they'll be around for at least another 10 years. Well, they shut down Funland. Well, just shut down a few ago. weeks ago. I mean, no. a few months ago. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of Wagon Wheel. The, uh, oh, no, like the Funland yeah, Drive-In in Hillsborough yeah. um, uh-huh. shut down. And I heard Ruskin was not in good shape. Yeah, well, who wants to go see movies at these places? You, like the, That's where they're at. I mean, I mean Silver Silver. With, with highly populated areas like that, that there's, there's yeah. nowhere like you'd have, how, how expensive that land is just to show drive-in movies. I don't think you'd make your money back in this what? area, like Pinellas County. I, I think that like right now, you, you need probably three acres just to do a drive-in, and an acre is probably like four hundred grand. And that's just, just for, for one screen. Just for an acre, <laughs> like that, that. It's not. Do you think you're gonna like be successful? Charging what? five bucks. <laughs> I don't know. I was just. Are you talking to me? Yeah. Well, I'm saying in general because you had oh. you had the question about. Uh, you did? Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> see what I have to deal with. <laughs> well, I was thinking about other stuff while you were talking about nonsense. It wasn't nonsense. It was, it, 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 it was, a, it was the business of movies, of uh, screen uh, movies. <laughs> yeah. All right. Like, you, you have to have, like, a good return because, like I said, you need all that. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I, I don't see drive-ins being popping up like that because of the areas, um, especially in Florida. Well, Florida, maybe not. Well, yeah. this area. Yeah, I mean, I know the realty is getting out of control. Florida sucks yeah. for drives because it's so freaking hot. Yeah, you yeah, gotta keep it. your car on and just. 
you never been down to the Everglades outdoor <laughs> swampland drive-in <laughs> theater? Man, no, that's, no. Yeah, great. you can get bit by a rattlesnake and eaten by an alligator. And it's mosquitoes. Great. Uh, have, oh, you, have, you, uh, okay. have you partook in um, uh, drive-in lately? Drugs? Oh. What? <laughs> <laughs> the, I think it's the oldest drive-in in the state of Virginia. Uh, I was at last year, and they had 1,000 cars. Wow. It's nestled in a little valley. Which is we show oh, content. Yeah, I bet too. that's beautiful. So I was there for an event. It was really awesome. That's right. Um, but it's definitely. I mean, I think it's it's a, it's definitely a community oriented yeah. kind of venue. That you know, there will be those um, that I think will survive. Um, and, and, and this is Big Stone Gap, Virginia. So this is you know population five thousand. I think they were all there that night. Yeah. You know. Um, it's like the town that feared sundown. Yeah, dreaded that sun. Kind of dreaded sun. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah. But yeah, see, they, they have the land and stuff. They have like the the atmosphere yeah. for it. Well, so. I'm not gonna build one. You should. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you have all this positive stuff to say about. Well, I mean, I just try to get my movie seen. That's all. I'm just saying. Exactly. I'll go build a fucking theater if I have to. Yeah. Well. So what's next on your plate, Paul? What about pop up theaters? Sorry, go ahead. Pop up theaters. Yeah, I like that idea. Well, um, like, seriously, like we get a semi, right? And it, it opens up the trailer. They have trucks into that, a theater. They have trucks that have. And it's full of chairs. You pull all the chairs out and you do like a fucking pop up theater on the side of the road somewhere. Well, well they do that for backyard theaters. They do. They, 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 you bring your own chair. Yeah, yeah. Don't want yeah. Chair, blanket, or just see your lazy ass on the grass. They have that. Uh, 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 Chase has. Sorry, go ahead. Park. Sorry, it's just. I always think I have a great idea that's already been done. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what's next on your plate, Paul? <laughs> um, uh, next month, on uh, I think it's the 17th of April, uh, my, uh, I play Richard Nixon in a Showtime series. Nice. Great. Um, that's cool. That, that, that's really going to be fun. That's a beautiful story called The First Lady, which is more or less they take historic moments in the White House told through the eyes of the First Lady. So... The first oh, first lady cool. that we, I think, is in the series is Betty Ford, played by Michelle Pfeiffer. Ooh, oh, and then nice. Aaron Eckhart plays um, Gerald Ford, and I play Richard Nixon in that series. That's um, Judy, Judy Greer has a great little role, and Dakota Fanning oh, plays their daughter, Susan. Did you meet um, Michelle Pfeiffer? Sorry? Did you meet her? Oh, yeah. I'm got with her. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is she still amazingly beautiful? Yes. I mean, she's like that big. Yeah. All right. Um, but she's she's every bit of the Michelle Pfeiffer you remember, yeah. and and lovely to be. Yeah, really, really, really fun. And, and I had a great time with Aaron. I was kind of chiding Aaron Eckhart because he really wasn't affecting his voice too much. And you know, Joe Ford had kind of a high voice, a hard Irish from Michigan. And I was like, "What are you doing, dude? We got to get into it." Because I'm like going full on, right? Yeah. Oh, no. And he's like. He's like, you're a freak. I'm not doing what you're doing. You're a freak. So we, we had a good time. Um, <laughs> Bi- Viola Davis uh, is the EP. She, she was the boss. She also Maybe. plays Michelle Obama in her, in her little three episode series. Oh, and it yes. ends with Joe yeah. Anderson playing Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, Kiefer Sutherland is FDR in that. So it's a really uh, a fantastic cast. We shot it in Atlanta about this time last year, yeah. uh, just south in, uh, near Conyers. Uh, on a sound stage, it was kind of fun walking in to you know the East Room at the White House, and right. my Oval Office at the airport. It was really, really cool. But uh, just a, Suzanne Beer uh, was our director. She did the box probably most yeah. notably. Yeah, um, she was great. So uh, I, I I love it when uh, international artists, so people from foreign countries, uh, she's from Denmark, ah. deal with American history because yeah. they have such an interesting. Different they perspective. Sure. And, yes, they do. You know, we, we take a lot of that for granted because we grew up listening to that and, and learning about that through school. Yep. But it's, it was really fun to kind of see her really embrace that material. Um, and, and I think it's going to be great. It should be it should be really fun. So that's coming out April 17th on Showtime. Um, and then I might I might be starting production on another little project soon. Ooh. But uh, I'll, I'll come back to talk about that one if that falls in place. Absolutely. We would love to have. Yeah, you. and and we might. Yeah, and and I'm hopefully I'll be working with Paul. It will be working with Paul in September. That's the goal. Yeah. So very nice. But did you hear? Yeah, any, uh, uh, on a side note, did you hear anything else about that thing we did? No, because I haven't heard shit. 
I am what he's saying. Uh, uh, I think they're still. I mean, they, they weren't really officially supposed to start until like early April. So okay. I think it was a little premature, but what we did anyway. I've been not even ready for casting yet. Right. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep a person if I find out more. I'm due to uh, kind of touch base with um, one of the key players involved soon, our buddy Tony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll find out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to update there. Nice. Very nice. Yeah. Is that it for our, our Paul? Uh, oh, and by the way, concert. Oh, yeah. What is that? We have, my brothers and I have this kind of, well, I call it our bid for immortality. We formed a band, and we never really set out to do it, but it started as a birthday party for our brother Mark. Mark is between me and Patrick. And uh, Mark is an exquisite guitar player. So that was about 15 years ago. And since then, the media uh, dubbed us um, Van Wilson because we play a lot of Van Halen. Um, <laughs> Mark is Mark's the Eddie Van Halen. Patrick plays the drums like Alan, and I used to play the crowd. Like Ridley Rock. So... Um, since then, uh, since that birthday party about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, we raised about a little over a quarter of a million dollars for local charities. Wow. So we have a big one coming up on May 29th at Janice Live, downtown St. Pete. But uh, in the first two weeks of announcing, we've already sold nearly 900 tickets in our place. So nice. that's been great to see the support. We've got some great sponsorships. Um, it, some, so some wonderful support from the business community and obviously our fans. So that should be a rip roaring time. Yeah, so you're David Lee Roth. Yep. Can you do the jump splits? Um, <laughs> I might be able to. <laughs> not holding the camera, but yeah, I, I used to do the flying Russians. I used wow. to do those. Um, wow. But at 54, I decided not to do that anymore. But I'll do that. that I break both my knees. <laughs> I've been told that I I have a very high kick. That most NFL punters don't have. Wow. So wow. Um, Maybe that'll definitely be in, 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 that'll be in the cards that night. I, I, I to to Brady. To. So call up Brady. If you guys join a union, and you go become the Bucks punter this year. <laughs> I could do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not that fast anymore. So we'll see. You, know, you just got to get it through the uprights. If they touch you, you can act it out. Oh, he hit me. and just knocked out. Just yeah. Fall, just fall down. down. <laughs> I think we're going to be in good shape now that we've got Tom Brady back. I expect, yeah. if that, if, I don't know if that happened yet, but I expect we're going to go back to Gronkowski oh, as well. Yeah, right? uh, we'll come back. Oh, that'll, right. that'll be the end of the week. Oh, yeah. You know him. He's like, oh, buddy, yeah. Tom Brady's yeah. back? Oh, yeah, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be back. I'll be there on Monday. <laughs> I'll be right there. Yeah. I'll be right there. 7 a.m., guys. But, Paul Wilson, thank you so much yeah. for joining us this morning. Thank you for joining us in Killing Collab. Thank you all. Yes, every time. I appreciate it. Thank you. great, buddy. I love you, man. Thank all right, you. we'll talk soon. Thank you guys. Nice. Really, hope, hopefully, we get you back nice. on soon. Nice. Okay, thank you. See you, See you, See ya. Bye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Wilson. There he is, shutting it down. <laughs> well, that was a great one. That's good. Are we That's done? Good. No? We're still talking. Okay, great. I didn't end the show first. All right. But I figured he wanted to go because he was walking around pacing. So I yeah. Yeah. I read the, I read the, I read the, you know. I read the room. I read go. the room. Yeah, there you go. Red room. Red rum. Red rum. Red rum. Red rum. Red rum. Okay. Yeah. Now, what do you got going? I don't got nothing. Nothing. What do you mean? I'm just talking about fish people. Nice. I'm trying to get that. How's right. that going? Good, man. I uh, We got two investors. To, I'm talking to two investors. I'm going to see one when I leave here. Nice. And see what he has to say. But I assume I probably won't really have any answers till the end of the week. Wow. Uh, but at the end of the week, I'm going to hear from both my investors whether they're going to go or not because we got to go. The fish people. <clears throat> yeah. I'm excited to be on, help you with the project. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. That's all I really. I mean, I might talk about doing South of Central, finishing up season two. Nice. You know, okay. I don't know. Uh, I got really busy with. Not. I mean, um, we still got. Uh, uh, um, ladies and gentlemen, on uh, Real People, Real Content, make sure you, you're you fo following and watching each episode that we do post every Wednesday at 6 p.m. of South of Central. South of Central, it's the place to be. S season one, I think episode four comes out Wednesday. Wednesday, tomorrow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, be, <laughs> be sure to check that out. Yeah. Uh, Very good. Yeah. Thanks a lot, guys. Uh, Chris, you got anything? How's your cheerleader movie done? It's going good. I finished the edit. Um, nice. Sell to me. Color graded everything? Yeah, everything's color graded. Fantastic. Everything. We just got to do music, uh, score, mm -hmm. and uh, sound effects, stuff like that. Credits. Oh. And uh, so we're looking at 
a May premiere, maybe early May. Nice. Mid May. Nice. Probably rent a theater out and show it and um, see what happens. And if you're not subscribed, please make sure you subscribe, like, and follow on all our, our podcasting websites, such as Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, um, CastBox, uh, Spotify. Man, we have so many different. There's so many. There's yeah. so many. I think if, if you can't see us, you're... follow me personally at Joey Giggle Pants. G-I-G-G-L-E. Pants. Joey. Joey Giggle Pants. I wish he would wear some pants. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. All the same. Joey Giggle Pants. Yeah, you I gotta start. I gotta start Instagram. And, and you know me, yeah. Tone Deaf on Florida, on Instagram and TikTok. Yeah, I don't have a TikTok. I don't have anything to TikTok about. You play with your TikTok all the time. Well, okay. that's a Tic Tac. Oh, oh, you should just cut oh. it right there. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us <laughs> on the Carrie yeah. Podcast. Chris Lato, Joe Davidson, and myself, Tone Deaf of Florida, Tony D. Goodbye. Bye.